very natural human tendency. I think the remarkable thing, the thing that needs to be explained, is not why we've had a movement toward collectivism and toward more government control, because that's been the natural state of mankind for thousands of years. The remarkable thing, in my opinion, from an intellectual point of view, is how you ever managed to get a century or a century and a half in which the dominant philosophy was the opposite. That's the exception. But it's so fascinating to hear you say that this has been the natural way in which men have moved since the beginning of time toward collectivism. Then why do you describe that brief period, that century or century and a half, as uh, the more normal, the more appropriate oh, I state? Don't, I, oh, you've used two terms. Fair enough. You said more normal, more appropriate. It's a state I prefer. It's a state that I think would be very much superior to what we're heading into. It's a state I think the ordinary citizen of this country would find superior. But it's not the normal natural state. And suppose you want to take a broad view of history for a moment and of geography. You cannot find a date in history at which the greater part of the human race was not living in a condition of tyranny and misery and dictatorship. Take it right now. The bulk of the human race is not living in a free world. The bulk of the human race is living in totalitarian or dictatorial governments. Can you name any date in history in which that wasn't true? Now, more extreme. Take any ge place in geography. Put your finger on the globe and go back over time. I don't believe there's a place where you can put your finger on the globe where mankind has, for most of human history, lived except in tyranny and misery. And so you had a few brief occasions, Greece in the 5th century B.C., and even there it's mixed because you had a slave society. Mm -hmm. It was a free society for the upper classes, not for the community. You had a brief period during the Renaissance in Italy. You had a, and then you have the latter part of the 18th and the 19th century, mostly the 19th century, first part of the 20th century. Those are the exceptions, not the rule. Then you're the one who seems to want to interfere with the natural order. Absolutely, I do. Then why do we call you a uh, conservative? <laughs> because I'm not. <laughs> because I'm a liberal. I want people to take thought about their condition and to recognize that the maintenance of a free society is a very difficult and complicated thing. And it requires a self-denying ordinance of the most extreme kind. It requires a willingness to put up with temporary evils on the basis of the subtle and sophisticated understanding that if you step in to try to do them, you not only may make them to do something about them, you not only may make them worse, but you will spread your tentacles and get bad results elsewhere. You know, the may, uh, another answer to your question as to why you seem to have the drift to collectivism is along these lines. The argument for collectivism, for government doing something, is, is simple. Anybody can understand it. If there's something wrong, pass a law. If somebody is in trouble, get Mr. X to help him out. The argument for, a free, for voluntary cooperation for a free market is not nearly so simple. It says, you know, if you allow people to cooperate voluntarily and don't interfere with them, indirectly through the operation of the market, they will improve matters more than you can improve it directly by appointing somebody. That's a subtle argument, and it's hard for people to understand. And moreover, people think that when you argue that way, you're arguing for selfishness, for greed. That's utter nonsense. The people who are in positions of power in a political hierarchy are also selfish and greedy. Mankind is selfish and greedy. And one of the interesting features about the 19th century that, I, uh, that we were talking about, I wonder if you realize that there is no century in human history in which charitable and eleemosynary activity has been as widespread and on as large a scale as it was in the 19th century. The charge used to be made that there were so many people trying to buy their way out of hell. Well... Uh, or into heaven. It's not too bad to have a... Uh, can you think of more innocent ways in which people can be employed? Yes, but, but it interests me that you just said mankind is selfish and greedy, and that has always been the battle cry of those who have said, therefore, we must impose controls upon them. Therefore, we have to put power in the hands of other selfish and greedy men. Now, I, I want to apologize for what I said. The great bulk of mankind. There are always conspicuous exceptions, not everybody. And also, for each person, there's an exception. People are selfish and greedy in one aspect of their activity. They are unselfish 
and uh, uh, generous in another. No, I, I understand so that. But I don't mean to be making a... I understand, but again, that is the philosophic basis of the argument that government must step in. But it's a, it's a false argument because it assumes somehow that government is a way in which you put unselfish and ungreedy men in charge of selfish and greedy men. But government is, a, is, an, is an institution whereby the people who have the greatest drive to get power over their fellow men get in a position of controlling them. Look at the record of government. Where are these philosopher kings that Plato supposedly was trying to uh, uh, develop? Limited to that uh, Athens you've been talking right. about. Right. Well, they never got power there, or they wouldn't have been philosopher kings either. Acton, Lord Acton, of course, made his famous comment, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So that I do not believe that that argument will, su that, that base will sustain the conclusion. Well, isn't, isn't there a major question, though, related to those who say that Lord Acton really was saying that power tends to corrupt, and I suppose that absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely, yes, and, that, that. and that it's too simple to say that power corrupts, and that there's a trade-off here and a balancing which leads me to, to, to ask you, literally, in these last few minutes, where are we going in your estimation? Uh, quite honestly, quite directly. Sure. There is a balance, you're quite right. I'm not in favor of eliminating government entirely. I think government has grown all out of proportion to its scope. Where are we going? I believe that that depends on us. That that's not in the cards. It's not. Na uh, we are masters of our own destiny. But if you take the road we have been on, we are heading toward a destruction of our free society and toward a totalitarian society. We are unfortunately headed down the route which Chile has already taken essentially to its end, which Britain has taken much farther than we are. Now, I ho uh, we still have time to avoid it, but we will not avoid it unless the people of this country recognize the danger and take very difficult and important steps to set a limit on the extent to which they are going to permit government to interfere with their lives. If you thought that we were not going to avoid it, that we were going to continue down present paths, the path to surf them, perhaps, would you then try to develop some different kind of philosophy, some different kind of approach that might enable us to make the jump from the freedom that you embrace and the near serfdom that seems likely in the future? I don't believe so, because I think there, if you go down that road, I don't believe there is any philosophy which will enable you to avoid it. I believe, I would, my own reaction is very different. It is to say we don't have to go down that road. I may think the chance, I really do think, that the chance is a good deal less than 50% that we'll be able to avoid it. We may well be fighting a losing battle, but if it's the right battle, if it's the only alternative to serfdom, then we ought to fight it and try to convert that 15, 25, 30 percent chance, whatever it is, into a certainty. There are some sources of support on our side, fortunately. Tell me, give me the name of two, please. I will be glad to. Number one is the extraordinary ability and ingenuity of the American people in finding ways to get around laws. That's a major source of strength for freedom. And number two is the inefficiency of government. People go around complaining about waste in government. I am always reminded of a, say, of a wonderful saying of an old teacher of mine. He was a teacher of statistics, and he made this statement about statistics, in which he said, pedagogical ability is a vice rather than a virtue if it is devoted to teaching error. Well, I say thank God for government waste. If, if government is doing bad things, it's only the waste that prevents the harm from being greater. And the waste of government has two very important elements. Number one, if government were now spending the amount it spends, which is 40% of our income, governments, federal, state, and local in the United States, have total spending, which equals 40% of total national income. If they were spending that efficiently, we'd be slaves now. And in the second place, the waste is so obvious that it arouses a counter-movement on the population at large,